Right, okay, so I'm going to introduce the, the next uh, thing, which is the Django Technical Design Panel. Um, and the person who will be moderating it is Michael Trier, who probably most people know more for his smooth and silky voice than, uh, <laughs> than his face. But uh, here you go, Michael. All right, thank you. Um, I do want to start by thanking Robert Lofthouse and the panelists for allowing me to participate today. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to be here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, first up is Simon Willison. And uh, sorry. Simon is a well-respected web developer from England. He had a one-year internship at World Online, during which time he and Adrian developed Django from scratch. The most enthusiastic Brit you'll ever meet, he's passionate about best practices in web development and maintains a well-read uh, web development blog. So I think most of you know who Simon is. Um, Malcolm Trudinick. <laughs> Malcolm has been a Django user since October 2005 and is a Django committer since uh, March of 2006. Malcolm has been programming in Python since about 1997, a Linux user and an open source user and contributor even longer. Malcolm previously wrote a lot of software for the financial sector and um, these days, most of his time is spent working on Django and random pieces of consulting in a variety of areas. Let's have Russell Keith McGee. <laughs> Russell uh, became a core developer for Django in January 2006. He's responsible for developing a number of major features in Django, including the testing framework, New Forms uh, media framework, and uh, he's currently mentoring a Google Summer Code project to add the aggregate functions, which we heard about yesterday, to the Django ORM. He's the uh, co-founder of Django Evolution, which we'll be having a panel about later today. And um, he's done a whole lot of other things. <laughs> I'll, uh... Next up is Jacob Kaplan Moss. Probably needs no introduction. Jacob is the co-creator of Django along with Adrian Halavati. He's the author of the Django book. He's been involved with Django since uh, before it was called Django. And he's currently employed with um, Whiskey Media, where his job is hacking on Django. James Bennett. <laughs> James works for the World Online, the birthplace of Django. He uh, also helped to develop eight Ellington, a content management system for news companies. It's written in Django. He's a release manager for the Django project, and he occasionally contributes code and documentation. He's written a very popular book, Practical Django Projects. Hope you have it for A-Press. And uh, he's the man behind the always interesting and popular blog, The B-List. And finally, Adrian Halavate. You all know Adrian, but he's a web developer with a background in journalism. He's known in journalism circles as one of the pioneers of journalism via computer programming, and in technical circles as the guy who invented Django. Um, Adrian Halavati was the lead developer for the World Online for two and a half years, during which uh, Django was developed. And he's the leader and founder of Every Block, which is a news feed for your block and a very cool website. So thank you. Uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm just going to ask a handful of questions and then I'm going to open it up to the floor because I know that a lot of people probably have questions that they want to have the opportunity to ask these guys. So, uh, Simon, I want to start with you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> open ID is something that you've written a lot about and additionally you have the Django Open ID project. Um, a lot of people are interested in supporting Open ID and although there's your project that we talked about, I think there's a sense that this should be something that's built into DjangoContrib.auth, and I'm wondering what your feeling is about this. So the Django OpenID is interesting. It's, it's good that you put me on the spot about this, because I've been a very, very bad maintainer. I, I put it out a year and a half ago, and then basically didn't touch it, and other people have had to fork it and do improvements and get it working with the new OpenID libraries and so on. And actually, in the past couple of weeks, I've done a complete refactoring of the whole thing, which is sat in a branch on Google code, and people are welcome to go and look at it. I was hoping to get it out before the conference and evidently didn't quite manage to get it there. Um, 
And I've actually been using that to explore this concept of class-based generic views, which I think is incredibly exciting and means you can do some really interesting stuff. As for getting it into Django Contrib, um, is this actually relates to what Mark Graham was saying. There's an interesting dependency that um, the Django OpenID library only works in conjunction with the full-on OpenID package from Janrain. So there's a question to be asked about whether or not um, stuff in Contrib is, can have external dependencies. Well, I think that's been answered by the GIS stuff, which has <laughs> dependencies on, on half of the world, most of which you have to compile yourself. Um, so I will, I, another, one thing I think we'll be talking about later on today is the process for nominating things for Contrib, which is something we've been discussing quite a bit recently. And I intend to put it through that process. Um, whether or not it gets into Contrib, contrib depends on, on how those guidelines end up working, I think. Thank you. And uh, if, if any of you have else have comments, feel free to step in. Um, Adrian, we just heard from Mark Ram that uh, what's going on with Turbo Gears and also it seems like in the Python community there's Django on one side, which he talked about, and the rest of the web frameworks on the other, and that, um, that Django has the batteries included sort of philosophy that everything's in the package, it's easy to get going and so forth, and the others sort of have this best of breed, however you want to interpret that, of um, pulling in um, the best products that are out there that different people are doing. Um, do you share a sense that the batteries included approach is the best way? I do think it's the best way, but I sort of have a different way of thinking about it. The way I think about it is a, an emphasis on getting stuff done and giving people a very clear path on how they can do that as opposed to sort of an academic, uh, we should be doing this because in these corner cases and sort of this academic perspective, uh, that sort of colors every decision that I make personally. Um, I think that in Mark's talk, he really had a lot of things that we should be doing, uh, particularly this emphasis, or the reason that he gave that, that really resonated with me the most was the whole Zope, you know, people will start, you'll start to get a a reputation for not playing well with others. And that is the, the, the argument that really resonated with me the most. The technical ones, the dependency chart, I don't really buy it that much because I'm sure that as, uh, I'm not gonna get political, but you can spin everything just as some of our sure. uh, people in Minneapolis did. Uh, so that's my rambling thought on it. Any other thoughts? Um, well, I think there's an interesting tension, but I don't think there's anyone on the stage who doesn't want Django to integrate m better with the wider world of Python web frameworks. I mean, that's a very obvious goal. Um, at the same time, the, the batteries included philosophy, the fact that you download one tarball and you unzip it and, and Django works out right. of the box is, is a really useful thing. So there is a very interesting question as to how we can sort of split things up and have, I mean, it's almost a technical thing. How do you make sure that Django dot lots of different things are available as separately installable packages as well as just one big tarball? And how do you manage dependencies on stuff maybe without getting into the whole sort of eggs and um, easy install that isn't quite so easy and all of those things? Yeah, we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> I think um, someone asked yesterday, um, you know, what we've learned from other other packages, other frameworks, um, but both in Python and not. And I'm re I was realizing, listening to Mark's talk, that one of the things that we really, I really took away from Rails that I think they did brilliantly was sort of solve the paradox of choice. You have this situation. I, I mean, I remember clearly at PyCon 2005. Um, a talk about the sorry state of Python web development. And there was a slide put up on the screen with every single package that you could use to do Python web development. And there were literally like a hundred of them. And you couldn't, no one of them would actually do anything you wanted to do. You'd have to, you know, combine about a half dozen of them together. And you'd have to, so when someone came up to you and said, hey, how do I do web development in Python? You'd say, well, you could use this with that, or you could use it with this, or maybe you could use these things together. And then, they, you know what? I'm just going to use Rails. It's one choice. And I think one of the things that we've tried to do continually is sort of solve that paradox of choice by making a decision, try, trying to sort of help people who aren't don't feel like they want to make that choice of 
which ORM should I use, which template language should I use, which you know, dispatcher should I use, and we just say, look, we, we have one, just, just, just use it. But the problem, well, the problem with that is that that's great for new users, but then once you get someone as smart and talented as Mark, it's like, well, I, actually, I, I know what I'm doing. I, want, I don't want to use your template language. And we don't make it obvious that, 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 that it's possible because we don't want to start the tutorial with, first, choose a template language. Next, choose an ORM. Next, choose a dispatcher, because someone's going to be like, I don't want to make choices. But I think that's a separate issue from trying sort of avoiding dependencies on other packages because we can say you only use Beaker and then depend on Beaker as an external thing. This is something we've always avoided doing because we want the single tarball. We don't like I've had problems with easy install in the past where I run it and one of the dependencies is 404ing and I'm completely stuck. And this is something we don't want to happen, but there there may be sort of that 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 this should be solvable in other ways. Jacob, um, I differ from a lot of people in that I'm actually not in favor of uh, expanding contrib because I think it kills innovation. Uh, the easiest and maybe unfair example of this is the comments contrib, where we ended up with a less than optimal solution for quite some time. Is that a concern you have, or do you think the benefit of having it included outweighs the disadvantage of stifling innovation? Yeah, so this is... Um so we use this opportunity of, of JenkoCon to have um, all, all the core developers actually sit down in a room for the first, actually meet each other in some cases for the first time. And when we discussed Django Contrib, this was, I think we spent the most time sort of wrestling with this issue of as soon as we sort of say, this is how we do comments, we kind of cut off, um, we cut off innovation there. Not that, not that we ever tell anyone not to try something else, but as a sort of de facto included standard, people use it. So there's a point at which it's sort of hard to make that choice of, of you know, what point do we cut off that, do, do we say this is the right way to do it, you know, obviously we get to define right, so it's easier to, for us to make that call. But um, in the case of comments, I think um, that's definitely a, a, a total borderline case. I think the reason that Django still has comments is because it has always had comments and we didn't want to pull something out that we already had. That may be a, a debatable decision, and I'm not totally thrilled with it myself. Well, and, and I mean, I always kind of look at it as being kind of like the Python standard library, which is it's there, and you know a lot of people can rely on the fact that it's there, but you don't have to use it. And like my example is uh, doing HTTP. I, I never use the Python standard HTTP lib. I use Joe Gregorio's HTTP lib too. And I think, does anybody here in this panel actually use Python HTTP lib? Okay, yeah. other than Malcolm, because <laughs> he's weird. Um, I mean, I look at that as, you know, the fact that there is an HTTP library in the Python standard library didn't stifle the innovation, didn't stop the development of a really good alternative package. And I, I really think that we, we can do that with Django as well, that if we come up with something or, you know, if we bless a package and, okay, maybe it's not as great as it could be, that's an encouragement for somebody. Somebody out there is going to take that as a challenge and say, I can do better. So can I ask a quick question of the audience? We know from Cal's talk that everyone in this room is building a Django blogging engine. <laughs> How many people didn't use Django comments, rolled their own comment system as part of that? So... That's a, it's a decent, how many people kind of stuck with Django comments but felt a bit like uncomfortable about it, but did it anyway? <laughs> okay, so I think that the people who just threw it away and, and started again do slightly outnumber, which is, it's, it's interesting. I will point out though that, that the, the, the comments package is, is new again, so that we're dealing with slightly old data there, but I, I suspect that if we ask the same question next year, we'll get a similar response. Right. So Malcolm, um, there are some things in the ORM, but not others. For instance, we have filters like contains, start with, ends with, uh, but no direct like to allow more complex matching. There is the regex thing I'm aware of, but that's a little different. Um, certainly some things are merely convenience methods, and the same thing applies in, with regard to template filters where we have trunk words, but not trunk characters. Um, I'm wondering what's the philosophy around what gets included and what doesn't? 
Why am I being asked this question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, numbers one, three, and four are the reasons. <laughs> These things were already there when I got here, right? <laughs> um, well, OK, some of it at the RM layer is the leaky abstraction problem. We're not actually providing um, filters necessarily, or my rational, my, I've reverse engineered a lot of these rationalizations without actually talking to these guys about it. But some of it is we're not actually providing filters that match what SQL does. We're providing filters that match what you want to do with certain Python objects. You want a string starts with this or a string ends with this. Use a regular expression to match against a string because you know Python uses regular expressions to match against stuff. Um, there's no like in Python, right? There's like in SQL. Um, we're not we try to at least have a handle on the leaky abstractions. Now, at, at the same time, the, the abstraction does leak. You can't use Django without, um, without realizing that you are running over a relational database, or you are running over a big table, or you are running over whatever your storage engine happens to be. So something is going to leak up. And sometimes you want to use Django as a more use the RM as a translation layer purely a different way of working with your data. And so at that point, you know how you want to get your data out. And we do get a lot of questions on Django users. How do I do the equivalent of this SQL query? Because they're not really programming in Python at that point. They're programming in SQL, but they want to work with the things in Python. And I don't know where the fuzzy line is. I personally have added no filters, template tags. I don't think I've added any template tag or any. I, I've added a template filter after we agreed it was a good idea. I'm really, like, I'm possibly one of the more conservative people on this panel when it comes to adding new stuff because I really want, like, this stuff can be done outside. Why is Adrian falling off his chair laughing at this point? <laughs> um, all this stuff can be done. Well, okay, it's a little tough now with database lookup types, but things like template filters and template tags can be, can be done externally. So, again, I want to see what people are doing and then they bring it to the group and add it. But I have to say, the real answer to your question is that was what was there when I got into town three years ago, and I really haven't changed, which probably says we haven't actually added a lot. Like, we've added, yeah, truncate words. Truncate characters, again, is probably historical. Like, it's kind of uncool to chop off words in the middle of the words, um, which it's means it's, it's not a journalism filter, so it wasn't there when I got here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can sort of see the argument that. Um, OK, I guess if you're using Django for your DNA sequence, you want truncate characters, not truncate words. But right. um, yeah, I'm, I'm the wrong guy to ask, why aren't we adding new stuff? Because you know, that's dumb. You don't add new things. It gets complicated. So it's a classic 80% solution, right? So everyone wants to do a less than query. Everyone needs to do an exact query or a not exact query. For more obscure SQL lookups, you know, the less popular they are, the, the lower the chance that we'll spend the time to do it. Right. So it's as simple as that. I think we're also really reluctant to remove stuff that's there. It's like, you know, um, oh, there's the, there's the phone to numeric filter, which converts something like, you know, you know, 855 love into the equivalent number, right? This is a core, this is a built into Django. Every Django installation has. How, how many people have used this template filter? Can I, can I ask? Yes. Hey. <laughs> I used it. That, that, I couldn't that find it in there before we. I couldn't find it anywhere in the Ellington source tree last time I looked. <laughs> so, but, but here's, but here's, here's the, the follow up question to that. What exactly do we lose by keeping it there? Anything? So it's. Oh, we have it, to maintain it. I mean, as, sure. as the numbers on phones change over the years. <laughs> when, we, when we add, when we switch to hexadecimal telephones, it's going to be quite a problem. There is something you lose. You lose, the expect, well, you lose the expectation about what other piece of irrelevant stuff should be in there. I mean, that's just as a, a sort of a long term project management. So, so it's just, you know. Maybe it should be yeah, it's, it's generally, we, we've, we've generally just faced removal of, of existing things with, with great reluctance because there doesn't seem to be a, a great reason to break even one person's code when leaving it there doesn't break anybody's. Right, that makes sense. Um, Russ, we have a schema evolution panel coming up later today, and one of the things that projects like this would benefit from, including Django itself, uh, when I'm thinking about the management commands, as well is a better abstraction of the database module level of the data definition language. So um, is this something that we could see in the future? 
it's not something that I've had to do for Schema Evolution. Um, there is oh, Schema, Schema Evolution, or the, the Django Evolution uh, project, has essentially written another module just like database creation and database uh, 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 introspection. And uh, the, the, the refactoring that I did about three weeks before 1.0 hit in was mostly to make sure that all of the interfaces are the same, all of the entry points to create a single many-to-many -many table and create a single field and create a single index are all exposed in the same way, and that I can drop in a, uh, a, a, an evolution module that is essentially looks the same as everything else that's there. Having a very brief look over the source code that's there for DB migrations and um, and South, they've essentially written exactly the same, almost to some well, extent. Exactly um, for interface. D migrations, I avoided that. I avoided doing a sort of nice API for table creation entirely. I just punted on that. I wanted to get something out that worked for MySQL only really quickly. So I actually hard coded a bunch of MySQL isms into the thing. And it worked great until I released it a couple of uh, I released it a week ago and stubbed out non-existent support for other databases and put a hopeful little note in the announcement saying, "Hey, if anyone wants to get this working with other databases, that would be really great." But what it made me realise is that actually, yeah, I, I'd personally love to see something of the same quality as Django's ORM for manipulating data that could actually manipulate tables as well. And I think um, South and um, Django Evolution have elements of this. Um, Demigrations doesn't at all. It completely avoids the question. So either we're going to merge them all into one fantastic migration system, which, which can ship with Django, which is what I think we all actually would like to do. Or at the very least, I'd love to see Django cover the bases for sort of basic table manipulation. So all of the hundreds of the migrations packages that spring up can at least not have to reinvent that particular part of the wheel. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think we're actually probably not... The, 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 the set of changes that you can do, at least from... The, at a basic, we need to add a column, we need to remove a column, we need to change the definition of a column. There aren't that many that you need to do, and the interface to them is fairly natural in terms of what you need. Well, the, but the, the complex one is how do you change the data that's in there and, and mutate yeah. it. And that, you're never going to build a common interface for that. Yeah, we should, we should stop talking about this right yeah, now. Exactly. Because we've yes. got a panel tonight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to let everybody know that I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, we're going to open up the mic. So. Uh, if you have a question, why don't you make your way now so that we don't uh, we can minimize the amount of waiting time. Um, the syndication framework, and this is for whoever, I don't, I don't know. Syndication framework is a very nice design, and it makes it stupidly simple to create feeds for a site. Uh, but if you're trying to do anything that's uh, more complex outside of that use case, it's not so flexible. And uh, recently, there was some addition of some new hooks that allow people to get a little bit more flexibility. but I guess, are you planning to solve that issue, or do you see something that this is better solved by a third-party projects like Django Atom Pub? Look. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's a fault of the design, that it doesn't let you add uh, arbitrary attributes. So that's, I would call that a bug. It, it's also, I mean, as, as the person who sort of looked at this most recently, I, I added the, these new hooks you talk about, so it's at least, at least a little bit easier to create custom feed types, specifically um, GORSS was the reason that, you know, we added that. But um, th there's, a, there's a lot in there that's sort of, um, that, that's one of the, the parts of Django that's been touched the least since it was originally written. Um, I mean, I, I, that, was, that, that predated open sourcing it, didn't it? So that's been around for quite a long time, and it's almost completely um, the same as it was um, back then. Uh, and of course, the, both the, um, both the world of syndication in general and the uh, level of sort of, you know, use of syndication has shifted since then. Um, I mean, GORSS, the iTunes podcast feeds, I don't even know that, I think we had to add enclosures at a later point because they didn't even really exist when we originally wrote that framework. So uh, my point is that I think that that's, as I was looking at the code and adding those hooks, I was going, wow, I really want to just you know, completely refactor this, rewrite it a lot. So I, that's that's one of my that's one of my pet goals. There, there's been some people. James is James Halber has written a Atom Pub Atom Feed thing, which is significantly better than our Atom support. So there's a lot of places where I think we can do better. Yeah, right. Right now we have this product called Duct Tape that was used a bit on that. Like this is one of the key bits of code that's in Django Utils, right? And it's like core code that was sort of suggesting this is a helper for something, but you can't actually not use it for that. It's, it's, it's 
I've, I've, I've had similar thoughts to Jacob that you're sort of looking there and you go, this is making my eyes water a bit. Where, because we're trying to work with at least two standards that don't actually mess. Well, one standard and one thing that was written down on a napkin in a restaurant at some point and <laughs> people implemented it. Several times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so we're trying to meet contradictory goals and so the code is sort of just holding together. If we try to actually extend it more, suddenly you have to decide, wait, this doesn't actually work with RSS or this, we're gonna have to not make, you're now gonna have to decide, do I use RSS or do I use Atom? And again, we have this thing on choices, right? It should just work. Yeah. Well, also that code exposes a sort of missing ability within Django. Like um, the, the RSS feed stuff has its own little class for generating XML, which is quite heavy to use and it's sort of a stack based. And it's because the Django template system shouldn't be used to generate pure XML because it doesn't guarantee well-formedness. Um, but ideally, we'd be using something like Element Tree or, or like one of the XML templating systems oh, or something, on. but that's a dependency. The simple XML DOM, which it's using, is really good for that stuff. It's fast. Reasonable, it's but... fast. You just, like, create simple element is designed to be subclass like that. Like, I think we're doing it the right way. At the point you start saying, we can't generate this without using LXML Well, we can generate anything with it, but I don't think it's a very good API. I think there are much better APIs out there in the world for generating XML documents. But Mark, Mark's point earlier, I mean, yes, this is true for all of us. Like, it's a sucky API for us core hackers because we don't want to introduce a dependency. But Mark's point earlier about how just because Django doesn't has to have dependencies does not mean that, y that okay. your Django, my Django apps have dozens of dependencies. My, my Django code has none. So there's a, you know, there's a big difference there between what we should not be encouraging our users to use those APIs because they suck. We should be in encouraging our users to use something like Elementary or LXML or something but like that. But then surely we should be practicing what we preach. We should be illustrating best practice in the XML generation when we generate XML in the core framework. And I don't think we're particularly doing that with the RSS feed stuff at the moment. I mean, we do it all right, but there are much better ways of generating XML. It's just that they have external dependencies that we're not trying, we're not packaging with Django, and we're not saying when you install Django, you must ins also install, sure element tree is installed, or whatever it is that we decide to use for that, which I think is a, it sort of exposes a, a deeper problem. All right, go ahead. Hi. Um, so uh, going back to where you guys were talking about the uh, introduction of new contrib apps, um, I, this might just be a conception in my head, but I kind of see, um, auth and admin and sites as being a different kind of app than something like um, sitemap or comments uh, in that admin and auth and sites seem to be really, really kind of not contrib apps at all. Um, they seem to actually just be optional things that you can use inside Django that aren't, they are so commonly used and they are so assumed to have been used that it's not really like an external application like uh, Django tagging or Django search or any of them. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, uh, you think that taking some of the apps which are currently called contrib, which really aren't, and making them part of the, the just moving them one step down in the namespace would alleviate some of the difficulty of determining what, uh, uh, what sort of weight giving something blessing means. Because I, I don't think that comments necessarily um, was as integral to using Django as, say, auth. Well, and, and at one point, actually, uh, if you really go digging back into the very first released versions of Django, um, you'll find like a Django slash models slash core dot pi file, which is where a lot of stuff that's now in contrib used to live. Um, so at one point, these were part of Django proper and then got factored out into contrib applications. Um, I, I personally, I'm happy with them being there. I think, I think it really serves as a testament to the fact that you can do the admin as a Django application. It doesn't have to be part of the framework and doesn't need special support from inside the framework. Anymore. Yeah, anymore. Um, <laughs> used to. But the fact that you can write an application that does that sort of shows the potential of this is where you could go. And so I like the fact that that's in contrib for that and that it is just an application, even if it's one that everybody's 
sooner or later almost everybody uses. So um, something we were talking about the other day is um, a nice goal for Contrib would be if you rm-rf it, Django still works. And at the moment, that's not entirely true, mainly because the uh, content type stuff is in Contrib, and if that's actually baked into other parts of Django. But that would be kind of a nice goal. It would also solve situations where you want a trimmed down Django that'll fit into a smaller amount of space and so forth. I, I wonder, though, if like... Um, Say a 1,000 files. <laughs> well, if, if you had Django core apps for like admin and auth and content types and sites and left Contrib for things like tagging or search or things that are sort of optional add-ons that are definitely the right way to have done them. Um, the, 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 main, the main point of moving that, those things, so, so originally co content types, user sites, that was all, that was all a part of Django and the, those, those had to be installed to use Django, period. Um, and and the, the, the goal was to make it possible to use Django without a database. And I've certainly done sites that don't use a database. Is there anyone else here who has Django apps that don't app use a database? Yeah, there. so App Engine. So if we move that stuff back into core, th those people are, are SOL. And if we leave it in contrib, yeah, it's sort of this one tiny little extra step of making sure it's in installed apps, but we've opened it up to a whole you know, extra class of users who don't want to use a database or who have a table called, you know, have their own users app that they want to just roll with, you know? So, in, oh, go ahead. In, introducing sort of two classes like the, you're saying these ones don't really strike you as contrib apps and other ones do. If, if we move them into Django core really special contrib apps, <laughs> there's like all Django core apps or whatever, we're creating a third hierarchy of applications. Like we already have two classes of, of applications written for Django. We've got the stuff in Django Contrib and we've got the stuff that isn't in Django Contrib that everyone else is writing. That's called Google Code. Um, <laughs> it's like, we, and we'd be introducing a third set that say somehow these are even different from these and it really does come down to, that's the ultimate bike shed argument. We could do this, but there's really not a lot of advantage to doing it because by being in Django Contrib, we're already committing to maintaining it. You're already, we're already going to make them optional because of all the, like there are technical reasons you can run without the admin, you can run without sites, you can run without auth, um, and there are plenty of cases to do this. So yeah, we could, but we don't gain anything and we actually make it even more confusing. Why are these things in Django core really special apps as opposed to Django string trib, as opposed to Django stuff that we care even less about, as opposed to not in the tree? We've already got the fuzzy line about where does stuff come into Django contrib and where it doesn't. A high, okay, Contrib is kind of a dumb name. I mean, uh, uh, a name I wouldn't have chosen. It was a, <laughs> because it, a lot of projects have a Contrib directory, which is literally where you dump if you're, you're an open source maintainer. Um, and I remember, like, you read the history of um, CSV particularly, and, like, patches started arriving early in the days of CSV, and he just started putting them in slash Contrib. And there's a whole, and there's usually a big readme saying, these may or may not work, I received them at some point, and, and they're not vetted, they're not audited, and if they break, you get to keep all the pieces. And our Contrib is not really like that, it's actually Django.maintained. Um, like, it's stuff we commit to will work. Um, but aside from that, it's just a place to put apps that are really our best practices in a way and stuff like that. And we're trying to improve that. Like, we're trying to make admin more and more divorced. It no longer has special blessing inside a model. It's separate. Comments is separate. Sitemaps is completely separate and so on. We are, we are trying to get to the point of RM minus RF contrib will just work. Again, they're a little bit blessed at the moment, but it is, I think we already have enough levels without introducing, here are apps that aren't contrib apps but are still not core somehow. My brain just starts hurting at that point. It's, yeah. and, and also, d just to, to go back to real quick Jacob's point about trimming down, that hearing that word kind of scares me because I'm on the uh, bug lists for all of the Django packages at different like Linux distributions, and I fairly regularly get reports from where some distribution decided to trim down the Python standard library and <laughs> removed some module that they didn't think would affect anybody, and it turns out Django needed it. Um, so I would really be against that sort of trimming. Yeah. yeah. Buffer stuff code yeah. Well, yeah. we keep getting bitten by Mac ports not shipping MD5 in Python yeah. by default, which is part of the standard library. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the deal with uh, auto add and auto add now? Are they really going away? And if so, what problem are you trying to solve? They're gone, aren't they? 
Really? They ought... Oh, we're stuck with them until 2.0. <laughs> they ought to, those ought to be gone. It's so you you can do that in so many other ways, in so many better ways. Uh, yeah, the, um, I had a look at this back back when that discussion first started uh, 18 months ago, uh, and the first step of that was getting rid of lazy date, which was uh, a wrapper around not being able to use a callable and actually say date time dot now rather than actually having this funky object. Um, I. I was looking at that and I was trying to get rid of it. And auto uh, the auto add now and auto uh, uh, yeah auto now and auto add now. Um, it's you can do it other ways. It's just not quite as elegant. And given that they are dates and given that you are looking for something that's going to happen, it, it is a, it is a an, a common usage pattern. And telling people that you have to every single time rewrite your save method just to have it updated every single time. I personally can see enough use cases that it is a simple enough thing that it's worth having. Um, and it doesn't really hurt if, you, if, it, if it's there, so. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> if, 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 we, if we get rid of them, we need to give people something that's even better. Well, I, I, I hear More that convenient. we, yeah, I hear we have documentation You're gonna write that now, and it, it's really easy to write uh, the, these custom model fields that can encapsulate all sorts of weird behavior. And so I, I've been waiting for somebody to write, and if you want a quick project and put up on Google code by the end of the day, um, write a quick project for a you know created timestamp field and updated timestamp field and we'll start using those because that, that's what I want. We have that in uh, Django extensions actually. So yeah, but, and I have those as well. <laughs> so you've just seen a scary insight into the development process. We've been actively sabotaged by two people on this panel who knew they were still in there and had forgotten to bring it up because they found them useful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have time for one more question. Um, all right. So I'm just curious, search is a really common thing for a lot of websites, and I'm just curious what the, the technical hurdle is for getting that into Django proper, because I think that's what Contrib needs, and I guess Django search is on the path to that, but I'm just curious what, what the big problem was, like, getting that in. If you just remember where you put it the first time, you don't need search. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so either you can have a huge brain like Malcolm, or... Um, no, when, when Joseph and I started Django Search, it was with the goal of it eventually making its way into Contrib. And, and obviously, that would only be with the, um, you know, with the overwhelming approval of, of the rest of the committers and the sort of community at large. Um, but our hope is that, you know, we'll, it'll be, we'll get it to the point where it's good enough. And, and at this point, we sort of, I haven't worked on it in a long time, so I, I'm taking too much credit. But um, Hopefully that it will get to the point where we can propose it as an addition to Contrib, um, and it will be so cool that everyone will say, "Hell yeah!" Um, right now, I don't think it's there yet. Right now, it kind of works for some people, um, but that's not quite the level of quality that we try to hit with <laughs> with stuff that goes into Django. Should actually work is kind of a requirement. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, well, it should work. Yeah, and also, I mean, it's important to remember. Look around you. This is the house that Search built, which is a testament to how hard it is to get right. Um, fortunately, there are open source libraries that aren't as good as our gracious hosts, um, but, but we could take advantage of. But it's just worth pointing out that this is not an easy or a trivial thing to solve. All right, I just want to thank our panelists uh, for coming up here today. and. Uh, Appreciate you allowing me to participate in this. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.